But if you remember, there was a story or time in Jesus' life in Matthew 22 where these religious leaders were coming to Jesus and they were trying to trick him into, by asking him a question. And they asked him, Master, Rabbi, what is the greatest commandment in the laws? And Jesus knew that he was, tr- he was trying to get tricked, but he responded and he said, here's the greatest commandment. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind. And this is the first and greatest commandment. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depends everything else of the law and the prophets. Jesus basically says, guys, this is what God wants you to be about. This is what God wants you to be motivated with. Love God with everything you have. Be, be driven by loving God. And then love your neighbor as yourself. There's three different relationships there. There's a relationship with God, an upward one. There's a posture of worship, an adoration, a love and dependency on God. We are called to be about Jesus. The reason we gather together week in and week out is to remind ourselves that our lives are about Jesus. Because the problem is we forget. We t- as soon as we leave here and we face a crisis or a stressful situation, we forget that God is for us. We forget that the Holy Spirit will enable us, and we go and try to do things in our own power and our own might. So we gather together on a weekly basis to remind ourselves, you don't no longer live to yourselves. You live for Jesus, and he's there to help you. He's there to guide you. He's there to be with you. You don't have to struggle by yourself. Then there's a posture toward one another. You love your neighbors. You love the people around you. God saved you, redeemed you, rescued you. Not simply so that you can gather together in a church setting and lift up Jesus and sing about Jesus and then go live your own life. He's transformed you so that you can be salt and light in the community that he's placed you at. And here's the cool thing. He places all of us exactly where he wants us to be. You think that you're on your campus by accident? No. God puts you there. And he puts you there to be salt and light. The job that you have that you're working at, it's not simply so that you can earn an income. God put you there. We recognize as believers that everything we have is because of Jesus. And so where we work and where we serve and where we study, all of that was in God's sovereign plan. And so we are there not just to study and not just to work, but we're also there because God has called us to be salt and light in those communities. Then there's a posture toward yourselves. Love your neighbors as yourself. Listen, if you haven't received love, if you don't understand the love that God has for you, then you're not going to love yourself in the right way. You're either going to think too high of yourself and think that everything you have is because of your wisdom and your knowledge or your ability, Or you're going to think too low of yourself and say, you're scum and you're dirt. But when you understand the love that God has for you, how he has saved you and redeemed you, how he has sent his son to die for you, that you are deeply loved by God, you have a healthy balance in your life. So there's upward, where we lift up Jesus. There's outward, where we go to make Jesus famous. There's inward, where we gather together to encourage one another as a family and remind each other that Jesus loves us, helps us, encourages us, supports us, and we pray with and bear one another together. Upward, Jesus, why we gather. Outward, mission, why we go. Inward, family, how we grow together. Listen, none of these are new. If you've been in church, you've heard this your entire life. We've talked about why we gather. We've talked about why we go. And this week, we're going to be looking at why we grow together. So I grew up in a pretty conservative family. I grew up, my parents were past. my dad is a pastor, uh, my grandparents on both sides were pastors, and I grew up in a very strict but good church upbringing. By the time I knew that I wanted to do ministry, I had become a product of my upbringing, and God began to convict me of certain lies that I started believing about myself. There were certain things that I started believing because of my upbringing that were lies. One of the lies I believed was that I thought I knew a lot about a lot of different things. I thought I knew a lot about the gospel. 
I thought I knew a lot about the character of God. I thought I knew a lot about the Bible. I thought I knew a lot about ministry, being raised in a pastor's home. I thought I knew a lot about love and a lot about grace, and the list goes on and on. Like I said, I grew up in a pastor's home, and the Bible was ingrained in my life. I was taught to memorize scriptures from a young age. I could have arguments, theological arguments, from the age of like 13 and 14 with people and argue anything I wanted to argue because I knew it. I thought I knew everything. Another lie I believed for a long time was that I thought I had to perform to please God. God had already dealt with me about how I was already accepted because of Jesus, but I thought that I had to perform in order to please him. That I was accepted based not on what I did or didn't do, but there were things that I had to do on a daily basis to make God happy. I knew I had access to God anytime I wanted. I knew that um, Jesus has given me access to God's presence. I knew that I can come boldly to the throne of grace and find mercy in time of need. I knew I was accepted and loved by God, but I didn't believe that he was always pleased with me. I thought there was a list of things that I had to do on a daily basis for God to be pleased with me. And these are good things. But I thought I had to do those things in order for God to be pleased. Reading my Bible every day. If I did that, God was happy. If I didn't, God wasn't happy. Praying every day. If I did it, God was happy. If I forgot to pray, God wasn't happy. So I thought that I had to earn God's pleasure. Another lie that I was convinced of was that I believed that I had to perform in my own power. Not only did I have to perform to please God, but I had to perform in the power of my own strength. And as God began to convict me of these things in seminary, it became very evident that I needed to experience transformation in my life. I needed to be transformed, and by God's grace, what he used was a community of believers called the local church that I was a part of to bring me to conviction and transformation. He used brothers, he used sisters who were willing and bold enough to say, hey, Sam, why do you behave like that? Why do you believe like that? Why do you think you know it all? Why are you arrogant? And he used community to make me more dependent on Jesus. Through friends, through church, God began to expose these false beliefs in my life that ultimately led to God working in my life that drastically changed my life. I've heard thousands of sermons in my life, but it was in the context of community that God began to bring transformation. Listen, guys, we need one another. We talked about the importance of gathering and hearing the word. But listen, there's a huge difference between listening to a podcast in your car as you're driving to school and work and being in this room on Sunday morning at 10.30. The difference is that when you are driving in your car and listening to a podcast, there's no one that you are held accountable for for what you hear. But when you are in this room, you're accountable. You can go after church and say, this is what I heard today. This is what God is dealing with me on today. This is what the pastor spoke to me about, and this is what God has been convicting me on. Will you hold me accountable to this? This helps us grow in our faith when we have one another, and that's super important. I've heard thousands of sermons in my life. I've been to a ton of conferences, heard the best preachers out there, but it took a few people in the context of church, in the context of community, for God to bring transformation in my life. God uses community to bring about gospel transformation in our lives. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. I want to talk about some of the objections that we have to being in community. I want to talk about why transformation is important. And I want to talk about how God uses one another to bring us to be transformed into the image of God. So let me be clear on one thing. As a church, we're not calling you to be here week after week, go on mission, or get involved in missional community group. We are not calling you to do that. That's not what we're saying at all. We believe Jesus is calling you to do that. And there's a difference. 
If we as an organization, as a church, say that this is what we expect of you and this is, we expect you to do this and we expect you to do that, then we're playing really close to that line of legalism and being in control of your lives. And that's not what we want to be about. But if this is what Jesus is calling us to do, if this is what our Savior is demanding of us, that we become all about Jesus, that we become all about loving our neighbors, and that we stay in the context of community to encourage and help one another, then we say, let's pursue Jesus. Let's do what he's calling us to do because Jesus is the one who redeemed us. So this is why we are talking about all of this stuff. We want to be a community that are transparent and open, and you acknowledge that you need to be transformed. And I'm not suggesting that you just get up there and you just start sharing all of your problems with everyone in church, but there should be a group of people in your lives, two, three, four, maybe your mission or community group, that you know well enough and you can speak gospel truth into their life and they can speak gospel truth into your life. And this is what we want to see happen. Now, I'm going to assume that many of us in this room have objections to that idea, the idea of gospel transformation in community. And I want to talk about a few of those objections. Number one, denial. Denial says that when, says that when it comes to gospel transformation in community, I have to be honest, I'm going to do it alone. I'm going to be okay alone. I'm good by myself. And that's not a lot different from the first lie that I was believing I know a lot about the gospel. I know a lot about the Bible. I don't need to be transformed. See, if you are in denial about your need for transformation, let me humbly say to you that you're being arrogant, that you're being prideful. It's arrogant to say that I know a lot about the Bible and Jesus. Really? You do? The gospel is likened to be like a shallow enough that a kid can play in, but deep as an ocean. And you're saying you understand all of that? It's arrogance for you to say that you know the Bible and you know the gospel. What about the character and the nature of God? To say that you know all about that? That's arrogance. We're going to be spending eternity in front of Jesus, and we're going to be bowing down before him day in and day out, and we will never, be over, we will never grasp him fully. And for you to say you know it, can I suggest that's arrogance? There's nothing but pure arrogance and ignorance. What about love? We think that we have a handle on that as well. Really? Love is a fruit of God's Spirit. And the moment you stop walking by the Spirit, guess how much love you have inside of you? Zero. Nothing. You have to be walking by the Spirit, which means that I am completely ignorant of love until the Spirit of life comes and lives through me. I don't know anything about love without Jesus. There's a counselor by the name of Paul Tripp who once said that our self-perception is about as accurate as a carnival mirror. And you guys have been to a carnival and you've been in a fun house and you've seen a carnival mirror. And in, in order for this illustration to work, you have to imagine that there are no mirrors in the world but a carnival mirror. The only mirror that you have ever seen is a carnival mirror. And so here here you are in front of the carnival mirror. And imagine there's no other mirrors out there. You stand in front of the mirror and you think, this is what you look like. You walk away. You're not willing to get input from other people about what they actually see in you. Someone asks you how tall you are. And you say, well, I was looking at the mirror and I look like I'm about two feet tall. Right? And they say, listen, I've got good news for you. You're not two feet tall. You're actually taller. I can see what you look like. But your perception is what you've seen. And you're looking at a distorted mirror. And you're not willing to listen to other people because of what you see. Self-perception is about as accurate as a carnival mirror. You don't believe other people. And you think you're super short. And our self-perception is not accurate. So we need other people to speak truth into our lives. We're often blind to our own deficiencies, and we need the help of others to help us grow. We need one another. We need one another to speak gospel truth into our lives. Because on your own, you're going to either think that you are okay, or you're going to think that you're a mess, and you need people to say, no, there's stuff going on in your life. 
that God wants to be working on. Denial. The second is refusal. I don't want to change. It's too scary. It's not comfortable. Where I am today is comfortable. Here's the reality. Sin is comfortable. Sin is familiar to us. Not only are we born into a sinful world, but we're born sinners. Sin is what we are used to. We're comfortable. The thought of changing is scary. Our false saviors, our idols, even though they do fail us, they do sometimes give us temporary satisfaction, and we would rather go with the sure bet, I know this will give me temporary joy and satisfaction, than to roll the dice with Jesus. We have this unfound fear that we don't want to roll the dice because we think we might not pay off. We'd rather go with a safe bet and live where we are and keep doing what we're doing. But listen, Jesus never fails. He never fails. And because you're in refusal, you don't allow him to work in your life. The third objection is pride. I don't need other people. I can do it on my own. I don't need people to tell me how to live. I don't need people to challenge me in my faith walk. The next objection is hiding and shame. I can never let people know what's, what I've done or what I'm struggling with. What will they think of me? I can't do gospel in community. I'm too ashamed. I can't tell someone I'm struggling with anger. They might not look at me the same. I can't tell my friends that I'm struggling with lust. What will they perceive of me? And so you would rather struggle in sin than find help in the context of community. The next objection is insecurity and fear. That if people really knew what I was struggling with, I wouldn't be accepted. I would be rejected and people wouldn't want to be around me. Another objection is Selfishness. I don't have time for other people. I don't want to invest in other people. I know I need to change. I know others need to change, but I choose myself over others. I'm not going to do it because I don't want to inconvenience my time, my life, my resources. I know it's right. I know I need it, but I'm not going to do it because I'm selfish. And the last objection is pain. A lot of us have experienced this. Relationships are painful. Close relationships are even more painful. A lot of you have been burned by the church, and a lot of you have been burned by other Christians. And yet, God is calling you to a gospel community for transformation because he wants to see you changed. You've been hurt, and you won't let anyone get too close to you again. Back in the 1960s, there was this music duo called Simon and Garfunkel. Um, Some of you might be familiar with them. Most of you might not. I tried to get them to play the song, but they said it was too old for us. Um, In 1965, at the height of the hippie era, they wrote a song called I'm I'm a Rock that captures a lot of these objections that we just talked about. And I want to read the lyrics to this song to you. And the lyrics are going to be shown behind me, I think. So if you see it, it's there. See if you hear yourself in the lyrics of this song. A winter's day in the deep and dark Christmas, I am alone, gazing from my window to the streets below on a freshly fallen silent shroud of snow. I am a rock. I am an island. I built walls, a fortress deep and mighty that none may penetrate. I have no need for friendship. Friendship causes pain. It's laughter and it's loving I disdain. I am a rock. I am an island. Don't talk of love, but I've heard the words before. It's sleeping in my memory. I won't disturb the slumber of my feelings that have died. If I never loved, I never would have cried. I am a rock. I am an island. I have my books and my poetry to protect me. I am shielded in my armor, hiding in my room, safe within my womb. I touch no one, and no one touches me. 
I am a rock. I am an island. And a rock feels no pain, and an island never cries. What a beautiful and heartbreaking song. The gospel calls us to so much more than just being a rock, than just being an island. And listen, if you're in this room and you've never trusted Jesus and you have no idea what it means to be changed in the context of community, I'm guessing that you can really resonate with some of the stuff that was said in that song. And I just want to tell you and encourage you that God's family is here for you today. Not only is God's arm wide open, but ours is as well. This is a community that will be willing to meet you where you at and hear your story and walk with whatever mess you are going through in your life. See, there's an interesting reality in the New Testament as we think about gospel transformation. The Bible calls us to do and be things that we already are. Let me give you a few examples. The Bible says that you have been sanctified, that you are holy. 1 Corinthians 1, 2, Paul's writing to a church that's a mess. They are messed up in sin, and he begins by saying, to the sanctified in Christ. You are sanctified. You are holy. But over and over in the New Testament, the Bible says you're called to holiness. First Peter, Peter writes, as he who has called you is holy, you also are to be holy. You're holy, but you're also called to be holy. Be who you already are. You are holy, but keep striving for holiness every day. The Bible says you're declared righteous. Romans 3.24, that we are justified. That means we are righteous by his grace as a gift. We're righteous. But the Bible also calls us to righteousness. 2 Timothy 2.22, flee youthful passions, pursue righteousness. You're righteous, but while you are righteous, Pursue right living. Pursue living after God. It's a command. You are this already, but keep pursuing it. Transformation is the same. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, If anyone is in Christ, you are a new creation. You are someone brand new. If you trusted in Jesus, you are new. You have gone from darkness to light. You have gone from death to life. You have gone from flesh to spirit. You have gone from old to new. You have been transformed. You're a new creation. Jesus raised us from the dead. You have been transformed. But Romans, in chapter 12, Paul writes, I urge you, therefore, brothers, in view of God's mercy, pause there for a second. He's summarizing everything that he talks about in the first 11 chapters of Romans. First 11 chapters of Romans, he's saying that here is what Jesus did for you. Here is how he has saved you. He has redeemed you. And now because you are a new creation, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Because of what Jesus has done, because he has transformed you, because he has renewed you, because he has rescued you, now present your bodies as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable. Do not be conformed, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Listen, this is an imperative, but if you unpack this, it's saying let something happen to you that is already happening. So you've already been transformed, but you're commanded to let the transformative work keep happening in your life. The word to be transformed there in Romans 12 is the same word that we use for metamorphosis. So I'm going to take you back to biology for a second, and hopefully you'll remember what metamorphosis is. But it basically means to change form. A butterfly is a classic example. The caterpillar goes into the cocoon, comes out a butterfly. It changes form. And here's the crazy thing. The caterpillar that goes into the cocoon has the same DNA as the butterfly that came out. The butterfly started with the butterfly DNA. The caterpillar started with the butterfly DNA. But the external demonstration of how they look is now radically different. 
The Bible calls us to be transformed. It's like saying you have a new DNA. You have Jesus' DNA inside of you, but you need to be transformed. The external demonstration of your DNA needs to be radically different from what it used to be. You used to look like this, but you have Jesus inside of you. You need to look different. See, this is huge for us in terms of the motivation for transformation. Often, the motivation for transformation is this. You have to far to go. You have so much good things going on in your life, so get busy. Or often, there's a positive spin on it. God has amazing things in store for you. God has great plans for your life. Get busy. Stay focused. Follow Jesus because God wants to do great things for you. Get after it. It's a futuristic approach. God wants to do stuff in your life, so focus right now. But the gospel motivation for change is not looking just at the future. It looks at the past, the present, and the future, but it primarily focuses on our past. Here's what the gospel motivation is. Look at what God has done for you. Look how God has redeemed you. Look how God has saved you. Look how God sent Jesus to die for you. Look how God rescued you. Let that motivate you to live your life for Jesus. Don't do it based on what he's going to do for you in in the future. Do it on what he has already done for you in the past. He has saved you. He's rescued you. The motivation for change is that you have already been transformed. See, this is the truth that set me free from the lie that I had to perform to please God. I needed to be reminded that I have been made righteous because of Jesus. But the righteousness of God doesn't just make me, righteousness of Jesus doesn't just make me acceptable to God. It's not like God says, okay, you're welcome, but you know, there's one or two things in your life that we need to really work on. That's acceptance. But pleasure is a completely different thing. The righteousness of Jesus is what makes you pleasing to God. When God said to Jesus at his baptism, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, he means that for you as well. And any moment that you think that you are not pleasing to the Father because of what you have done or not done, you're actually saying that the righteousness of Jesus is not enough to make me pleasing to God. I had to realize that this was true of me. There's no list to make me pleasing to God. There's no things I have to do for God to be pleased with me. I am, God is pleased with me on the basis of Jesus. Now, because I am pleasing to God, God has all kinds of hopes and dreams for me. But my motivation for living is not so I can earn God's pleasure. My motivation is because God is already pleased with my life. And I want to live for him. Radically different on how you approach life. But in order to be pleasing to God, there's no list. The lie was, all of this was up to me. That I had to perform in my own abilities, that I had to perform in my own power, and my own strength. I had to do everything that God was calling me on my own. You know, there's certain areas of my life that I am not moment by moment declaring my dependence on Jesus. And that's where I needed to learn that the power of Jesus is already there in my life. The risen Jesus is already inside of me. Guys, think about what you're going through this morning or maybe an argument or a fight or a stressful situation that you're going through in life. Do you know what you need 100% of the time? Do you know what you need every single time? It is love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, self-control, gentleness. That's what you need 100% of the time. You know, sometimes I pray and I say, God, this is what I need. I don't have it. Will you show up? Will you work in me? And will you work through me? And you know, God never fails but there are many, many, many times 
in my life that I don't even ask God for help and I try to live it in my own power and instead of love and joy and peace and patience showing up, what shows up is anger and pride and jealousy because I'm trying to do it in my own power and my own strength. But everything that we already need for life, God's already given us. You need love, the Spirit of God is in you. You need joy, He's in you. The challenge is, are we asking Him for help? One author said that God never requires anything from us that He hasn't already deposited in us. Everything that you need for life is already given to you. God's given it to you. Guys, that's good news. You have everything that you need. Let me talk a second about community. The butterfly analogy is good, but it breaks down because as a church, we're not transformed in isolation. The caterpillar changes into a butterfly in complete isolation. He builds a cocoon, hangs out, and he waits, and he's transformed. Many Christians think That's how transformation works for believers. I'll just hang out by myself, read my Bible verses, pray more, hang out with Jesus, Jesus by myself, me and Jesus, and I'll come out as a beautiful butterfly. Listen, that's just not true. Do we need times of solitude with you and just you and Jesus? Yes, absolutely. Even Jesus needed that. But that's not what's going to transform you. Jesus uses one another to make to challenge us to be more like Jesus. I do this in premarital counseling when I'm counseling folks. I remind people that the greatest tool that God has given me to make me more like Jesus now is my wife. Because it is through her that God exposes all of the sins in my life. I see anger, jealousy. I get upset mostly in the context of my marriage. And it is through her that I come and say, Jesus, I need help. And that's the same for church. It's the same with relationships. It is in the context of relationships that we see the junk that's inside of us that God wants to change. If it's just you, yourself, and I, and Jesus, the junk will never leave. You don't know what the junk is because you've hidden it. You need people in your life that will say, hey, pursue Jesus. Hey, Love Jesus. Hey, follow Jesus. Hey, let's pray that God will help you overcome this. You need one another. Transformation doesn't happen in isolation. We're not designed to live alone. From the very beginning of the Bible story, we see that humanity wasn't designed to be alone. From the moment God said, let us make man in our image, we see that we're designed for community. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit dwelt in perfect community. And when God created humanity, he created them to image the kind of community that he already had. God wove community and interdependence into the very fabric of what it means to be human. That means that when we choose to live in isolation, we're actually living a subhuman kind of life. Even the most hardened criminal, you put them in solitary confinement, eventually they break down. Why? Because we're not designed to be by ourselves. We need one another. And when God redeems a broken humanity through the sacrifice of his son Jesus, he didn't purchase a bunch of individuals for his possession. The Bible says he purchased a people for his possession. You are not God's only child, you are part of a family. Don't miss this. Jesus gave up his part in the family so that you can have a spot in the family. So when you isolate yourself, you are minimizing the work of Jesus and the sacrifice of Jesus. You are giving away the very thing that he died to purchase for you, a place in God's family. God did not redeem you, buy you out of the slave market with the precious blood of Jesus so that you can live in isolation. If you are a follower of Jesus, you are not 
your own, particularly as it relates to your relationship with God. Your relationship with God is not a private matter. We're here to challenge one another to pursue God with all of our lives, with all of our hearts, with all of our minds. We don't do it alone. This is why we need one another. This is why the Bible says things like speaking the truth in love. We're to grow in every way into him who is the head. The Bible says confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. It says love one another earnestly with a pure heart. It says rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. There is a context of family, context of community. One of the passages that we looked at last year was the book of Hebrews. And if you remember, the book was written to a bunch of believers who were pondering on giving up their faith because life was hard. And in Hebrews 3, the writer writes to them, and he says, Be careful, lest there be any of you that have an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from God. What would cause them to fall away from God? Unbelief. And he says, Watch out. And here's the remedy. He says, encourage one another daily as long as it's called today so that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. You have an unbelief heart and the reason for that unbelief heart is because the deceitfulness of sin and what's the medication, what's the cure, what's the remedy? You encourage one another daily. You be around people that can encourage you. You be around people that could say, God is for you. You be around people that say, I'm going to pray for you. You be around people that say, we're not giving up. We're going to push together. We're going to strive because God loves you. We love you. We want to see you grow. You want to stay away from our heart and heart? You want to stay away from unbelief? You need family. You need community. I need daily encouragement. I need daily reminders of who God is, what he's done, and who I am, and how I should live as a result of what he's done in my life. That's one of the reasons why we've worked so hard in trying to create missional community groups here at church. It's not about having another program or another group, but it's saying, hey, we can't live in community as a large body, but in smaller groups, we can get together. We can share, here's where I'm struggling. Here's where I need prayer. Here's where I need encouragement. And we can encourage one another. It's not about meeting. It's not just about saying you did another religious duty. It's about being friends. It's about being family. That means it takes time, energy, and work. It's important. Because it your spiritual life is vital. If you're not in a community group, let me encourage you, meet with one of us. We'll get you connected. We want you to grow. We don't want you to just show up here on a Sunday and walk out and not know what's going on in your life. Not because we want to know your business, but because we care about you and we want to see you pursue Jesus with all your life. We care because the Father cares. And so get in community. Maybe you're in a small group or something already. Use it. Don't just show up and just leave. Share your burdens. Let people know what's going on in your life so that people can be praying for you. Life in community is imperative for our spiritual health. And I want to close with a quote from a medical doctor that life in community is essential even for our physical health. In 2005, Newsweek did a cover story called Love is the Real Medicine. It was written by a Dr. Dean Ornish. He's a clinical professor of medicine at the um, University of California, San Francisco. Here's what he has to say about love and intimacy and relationships. He says, medicine today focuses primarily on drugs and surgery, genes and germs, microbes and molecules. Yet love and intimacy are at the root of what makes us sick and what makes us well. If a new medication had the same impact as love and intimacy, failure to prescribe it would be malpractice. Connections with other people not only affect the quality of our lives, but also the quantity of our lives. That is, our longevity 
and our survival. Study after study finds that people who feel lonely are many times more likely to get cardiovascular disease than those who have a strong sense of connection and community. I'm not aware of any other factor in medicine, not diet, not smoking, not exercise, not genetics, not drugs, not surgery, that has a greater impact on our quality of life, incidence of illness, and premature death. Love and intimacy, relationships, community, family. Guys, I am so encouraged about our church. We genuinely care about each other. And this was modeled in my own family this week. When we were sick, we had people that have offered to bring dinners to our house from our church. We had so many calls, so many texts to see how we were doing. We're getting it. We're called to be family. None of you are related to me. But the moment you heard that we were all sick, you responded. Why? Because we're family. Be encouraged. But let's keep striving. Let's keep pushing. Let's be genuine with one another. There's some of you in this room. You're choosing to live in isolation. And I'm praying this morning that the Spirit of God would convict you as we move toward communion here in a minute. There's some of you that are in isolation, and it's not largely by choice. There are people that are part of our family that some of us have not worked hard in building relationships with. And I'm praying that some of you, that God will begin to stretch you so that you will begin to build relationships with people that are different because you, that models who Jesus is in our lives. Lives are at stake. The gospel is at stake. We aren't meant to live this alone. And this table that we're about to celebrate is a reminder that we have been called into family. We used to be strangers. We used to be enemies. We used to be orphans. Jesus came. We are now friends. We are now family. We are now sons and daughters. This morning as you come to the table, I'm going to invite you to examine your heart. <coughs> Went the whole sermon without coughing. It was pretty impressive. Um, I'm going to invite you to examine your heart, your attitudes, your affections, your actions. I'm going to invite you to ask the Holy Spirit to convict you of things that maybe you don't see, but maybe the Holy Spirit this morning is speaking to you. Will you ask him to work in your life? As the team sings behind me, will you let him work in your life? And when you're ready, I'm going to invite you to come, grab the elements, and then go back to your seat. And I'll come up here in a few minutes and we'll partake of it together. This table reminds us that we are part of the family of God. We belong to Jesus. We're no longer in this alone. We're no longer by ourselves. We have a God who's with us. We have a family that's by us. Father, this morning, thank you for saving us, but also thank you for putting us into family. Thank you that we have brothers, we have sisters who care for us, who will push us to strive to be everything that God has called us to be, who will push us to be everything that you desire for our lives. So God, as we wrestle with growing together in community, would your Holy Spirit deal with our lives today? Would you change us and transform us so that our lives will model Jesus? We love you. It's in Jesus' name.